Previously on Necromancers. Nexus, the prodigy of necromancers, was taken from his parents by Anastasis, the leader of Necromantia. Since then, he has been tortured and trained by the Knights of Night and must challenge her each year for a chance to see his parents again. The origin story of Nexus continues in this epic poem, written, illustrated, and voiced by World Builder Zack. Necromantia may be known as the Wasteland of the Undead, but there was a time when it was a planet of science instead. Necropolis, the capital of Necromantia, spread its technology far and wide. Cultivating their fruit of knowledge was where they grew their greatest pride. Prosperity spread out from the capital like ripples in a lake, overcoming the lack of resources their barren planet could make. People were happy enough in their still growing golden age. That is until the day of rising, 1000 years ago, everything would change. In a small village on the eastern edge of society's end, a spiritual leader stumbled upon the canonic ability to raise the dead. She believed she tapped into the power of the Almighty God. To the scientists of Necropolis, it was a discovery most intriguingly odd. Necropolis descended on the village like a swarm. They studied the village priestess she was more than happy to perform. It was true, she could really do it and she could even show them how. She simply felt her energy cut through the ground like a spiritual plow. As a priestess she was more in tune with the energy than the others around her. Her people were able to learn it too, despite it taking them longer. The scientists believed it genetic, the villagers believed it divine. Kinetic abilities play out like this approximately half the time. To prove it was science and not something godly, a necropolis lab went live online and raised a dead body. In doing so, they described exactly how they did it, but the public instead used their explanation as a blueprint. Science is as science does, they should have left it vague. At first necromancy spread like a rash, then escalated to a plague. Necropolis retreated inside the walls and sealed itself like a tomb. Only their advanced technology would hold back the tide of doom. Slowly over hundreds of years, necromancy became a talent for all. All except Necropolis, necromancy was forbidden inside the wall. Anyone caught using it was immediately expelled, forced to live outside the capital as an exiled. Necromancy had a way of twisting people, magnifying their darker urges. Control over the dead is the place where the forbidden and temptation merges. Trust eroded between neighbors and friends, murdering for undead slaves became one of the common trends. Society eroded, hate and fear flooded every corner. Parents would hide their daughters out of fear someone would kill to control her. People eventually turned to a chasm deeper than they could measure. Because necromancy only reaches so far, the chasm became their greatest treasure. It's natural to seek comfort from things that cause distress. Many offered to bring order to chaos and enforce law to the lawless. Religion sprouted from spirituality, claiming to know the unknowable. Prophets and propaganda popped up at a rate that was uncontrollable. Churches and temples warred with each other, swallowing each other whole. The wars claimed the purpose of freedom and peace, but they really fought for control. One church's strategy was extremely simple, control the chasm to control the people. They successfully positioned themselves to control access to the canyon. This church then changed their name to the Church of the Endless Chasm. Control of the most valuable resource the planet has to offer gave the church the leverage to obtain the control that they were after. The chasm sucked in the wealthy and held peaceful rest hostage. They offered positions to the most talented as a way to escape the garbage. Controlling 90% of the people and even more of the land, the church declared the chasm the capital and the planet under their command. Last time we came to this wretched planet, we tried to converse with the people who ran it. The priest minister rejected us and our evil science. They refused to even meet with the advanced planet alliance. We now turn to necropolis instead, though they refused to use powers that raise the undead. 
These scientists asked me to intimidate their rival. By parking my ship above their city, I increased their chance for survival. But now the undead army surrounds us like a ring. There's nothing we can do except wait for them to start attacking. This siege will surely end in the end of Necropolis. I wish I could do more, but merely hovering here is almost treasonous. The Valeris remain neutral in private planet conflicts. We must sit by and witness the horrors that doing nothing inflicts. This dry rock is broken, I long to repair it. I fear when the church is done, there will be nothing left of it. Nexus, the prodigy, is now a product of torture. As a teen, he walks the line between child and something more mature. He should be broken, and in some ways he is. His anger is a pet to him. He owns it. It is his. Bishop Virgo is now the closest thing he has to a parent. Virgo still follows and fears Anastasis, but Nexus can sense his intent. Virgo drops his eyes to the floor. It is time again, Excellency. Time to show the priest minister how far you've come in necromancy. This time I can do it. I will show her what I can do. She'll reunite me with my parents if what she says is true. Nexus marches with determination to the pavilion where the Knights of Night train. Today is muddy and wet. The battle will take place in the rain. Last time, Nexus brought all the power he could bolster. For the first time he maintained his undead, she was not able to pull them to her. They fought long and hard, but she was still too strong. He realized by the end of that she had been stringing him along. It wasn't her power that made her stronger. It was experience and technique that tipped the advantage over to her. Searching for new ways to win this battle of wills, this year Nexus focused far more on his skills. This time he's ready. He will pass her test. He stayed motivated all year to give his very best. He steps into the rain, his boots start to soak. No attention to the storm, he pulls back the hood of his cloak. Anastasis stands below a tent at the other end, an advantage in comfort she was not willing to extend. She announces to the crowd, I have buried ten monsters in the soil beneath our feet. The first to draw blood is the victor, the other shamed in defeat. What is her long-term plan? She vowed to raise this boy to a man. Every time she wins, she fails in that goal. But if he wins, she risks losing her control. Short-sighted, though she must have thought this through. I still don't think I predicted exactly what she's trying to do. The battle will commence at the first lightning strike. She walks to her chair and calmly sets down her mic. Anastasis sits legs crossed, staring at her foe. Are her carefree gestures genuine, or are they just for show? Nexus stands swimming in weighted waterlogged wool. Fingers twitch at his hip, scanning the ground waiting to pull. He senses six giant snakes and four other foul beasts. Wait, one more? Is this a test? Or one of her deceits? It's faint. He can't quite make out what it is. But if it's part of Anastasis' plan, then he will make it his. He can't reach it yet, but he'll figure it out. It must be what this whole stupid battle's all about. Lightning strikes the ground. In a flash, Nexus yanks two snakes from the ground. So fast that the dirt explodes with a booming sound. Anastasis leaps up, running in place across the serpent's backs. Her chair and microphone devoured metallic undead reptile snacks. Nexus swoops them up and back like a wave chasing a surfer. Anastasis just smiles and yanks the undead tiger underneath her. They charge the boy, still keeping their focus on the snakes. Incoming claw, Nexus dives to the side. One scratch is all that it takes. He plunges the serpents down to where the tiger and Anastasis landed. She pulls out a gorilla, who deflects both snakes single-handed. The gorilla slaps the ground, exposing a noticeable crack. Nexus runs. Anastasis pauses, expecting another attack. She feels vibrations from earth under the ground churning. She's experienced. From this she knows the snakes are still burrowing. Patience lost, she sends the gorilla to charge. It closes in quickly, his form appearing increasingly large. Nexus releases his snakes at the last second to avoid harm. He reaches down and pulls up a gator that snatches the gorilla's arm. 
Nexus runs again, regaining control of his serpent pets. This plan is so dumb, he thinks, it's as risky as it gets. He roots up the snakes again, this time from below her feet. She straddles both heads and rides them to the sky in an acrobatic feat. She rockets a giant bat from the earth and lands on its back. She attempts to call the gorilla again and use him in a counterattack. The gator still has its arm. Wow, Nexus must be commanding three. She swapped to the tiger instead. It's easier than pulling the gorilla free. Nexus directs his snakes underground from above, aiming for the same spot the two snakes just blasted out of. What now? Anastasis flies too high out of reach. That's a defense that snakes and mammals just cannot breach. Could it be? Could this be how he'd lose? Was the bat the only right option for Nexus to choose? Nexus looks up and smiles at the ugly bat, even though he stands in the direct path of her battle cat. The tiger closes the distance alarmingly fast, faster than any defense this 14-year-old prodigy can cast. The earth collapses in an instant and Nexus is swallowed whole. What, here of all places, was a fracking sinkhole? What about Nexus? Is he dead now too? This can't be the end for him, this just can't be true. Tune in next week for the exciting conclusion of Necromancers. Now, click on the next video to go further down the rabbit hole.